He has been called one of the great investors of our time, Ray Dalio, the founder of hedge fund giant Bridgewater Associates. In this episode of Managing Asia, I sat down with the American billionaire in Singapore to find out how he makes sense of the volatile world around us. Ray, thank you so much for this exclusive interview. You're the founder and chairman of the world's biggest hedge fund, so financial volatility is not new to you. But when you look at the markets today, are you surprised at how quickly the narrative has changed from a global synchronized recovery to a global synchronized slowdown? Over the years, uh, there are always paradigm shifts, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, one gets used to a certain type of environment and then uh, there are periods of time where they shift to a very different kind of environment. For example, the 1920s were the exact opposite of the 1930s. Mm -hmm. So the transition from the 20s to the 30s shocked people. The 40s were different from the 50s and so on in all of their various ways. And so you come to periods of time where um, something has gone on for a long time, such as the easing of monetary policy in the ways that it's been eased through not only lower interest rates to the point that we have negative interest rates, mm -hmm. but also um, the quantitative easing. That paradigm, that leveraging up, for example, it can't continue. But yet, late in cycles, people extrapolate that which happened in the past, mm -hmm. and so there are these surprises. I think there are always these paradigm shifts. And I think by s stepping back and seeing history from a longer-term perspective is very helpful. Mm. But this time around, were you surprised at how quickly things have changed? Um, well, I'm not, you know, like I'm never surprised that, <laughs> to be surprised. Um, I think, what do we mean by those changes? I think that becomes the question. At how suddenly, you know, from Fed hiking, we've suddenly gone into a Fed dovish mode. Oh, I don't think that's surprising. I think the Fed made a mistake, and I think the Fed understands that it made a mistake in assuming that this is a normal cycle. And what they thought was, if you pick up growth and lower unemployment, you're going to produce inflation. We're living in a different world now for various reasons, a world of a lot of excess capacity, a world of digitalization and so on, in which that's not the big thing. The big thing is the fact that we're approaching an end of the power of central banks to affect, to stimulate. So the big thing mm -hmm. is that we have a very big asymmetric risk. If the economy turns down, and we are late in the cycle, so uh, a downturn will come, there is a lack of ability by central banks to be able to be stimulative and to reverse that. And that's happening at a time where there's great wealth polarity. So if the left and the right, if the capitalists and the socialists or the rich and the poor yeah. are at each other's throats at this time, and this is when times are good, imagine what it's going to be like when we have a downturn and there's an inability of central banks to respond to that. So that shift in Fed policy, which came at the end of the year, was uh, necessitated by these uh, weakening conditions around the world. Well, after making money for 18 consecutive years, your flagship Pure Alpha Fund lost money 4.9% in the first half of the year. Do you think you can do better in the second half? Well, I, you know, like every year we, we're going to have that kind of fluctuation, you know? Everybody makes a big deal over a quarter or a half a year, and I just want to be clear. We may not make money even every year. I mean, that's not, um, there will be some variations. Um, I think the key is, you know, us staying on top of these changes that we're talking about and responding to them. Hmm. You recently talked about a paradigm shift and how one should actually consider putting gold in one's portfolio. Why do you think gold is now a good bet? Do you think a downturn is inevitable? Well, uh, first of all, um, I think every portfolio should have the right amount of diversification in it. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to approach the question as both a strategic asset allocation mm -hmm. uh, move to put gold in a portfolio that I believe it always should be a certain part of a portfolio because there's a certain environment that it, that it diversifies the portfolio well and a certain environment to worry about. I also think that that environment is riskier, more likely, recently, now. And that environment is one in which it becomes very difficult to stimulate the economy, and there's a desire to depreciate the value of currencies. Now, think about a bond is really the currency. So when one owns a bond, 
or one owns a debt instrument. One is paid a pile of currency over a period of time. When there are a lot of obligations like that, a lot of debt or even unfunded lobby obligations like pension obligations or health care obligations that the world has, a lot of obligations, and there's not an effective monetary policy to lower interest rates and stimulate, as we're talking about, there needs to be a, um, the printing of money, the, the running larger deficits. We're going to come into an environment, I think, in which there are going to be larger deficits mm -hmm. that are increasingly monetized. And in that kind of an environment, the qu currencies are depreciated. Mm -hmm. That's an easy way to get out of paying your IOUs. So just to be clear, you're expecting money. things to take a turn for the worst? I think that um, in an evolutionary way, over the next uh, one, two, and three years that there will be a turn for the worse. Yes, I think that there'll be an environment in which um, you're going to have excess capacity and debt restructurings and political issues entering into it. I think the elections um, that we're going to have in the United States uh, mm -hmm. will have an important bearing. It is um, a contrast or a conflict between uh, the capitalists and socialists. I think we're going to see more of that. I think there's going to be an effect, um, a, a risk for capitalism and a need to Is monetary. a recession in the U.S. inevitable? Well, of course, the recessions are always inevitable. The only question is when, and I think that... Do you see one coming? Yeah, I think that in the next uh, two years, uh, let's say prior to the next election, there's probably a 40% chance of a recession. And I think that you're seeing this around the world. We're in Singapore. I think you can see that there's borderline mm -hmm. uh, a limited amount of growth. You could see it through Asia. You could see it in Europe, and you could see it in the United States. The Fed recently cut rates at the end of July, the first time it's done so since 2008. Where do you see interest rates? Do you think bigger cuts are needed at this stage? I think that, yes, I think you will see greater interest rate cuts as you start to see the world economy starting to slow down. And I think you're seeing that being led now by the bonds. That, in other words, long-term interest rates are falling faster than short-term interest rates. And that is inverting the yield curve. And when that happens, um, it means that cash is more attractive than bonds. And as a result, you tend to see then the movement toward cash and the slowing up of lending. So we have a situation in which there's a lot of pressure to cut rates um, at a time where the economy yet um, is, uh, you know, fairly operating at a fairly high level. Do you think activity. the Federal Reserve has the ability to avert a sharp and serious slowdown, or is the possibility of a fiscal stimulus now more likely? I think that we're now in a political year, so the fiscal stimulus, there's not going to be anything happening in the United States in the way of fiscal stimulus till we get past the elections, and then when we get past the elections, I think then we'll talk, there'll be uh, examination of, depending on who gets in, and there'll be a big change probably in fiscal policy. So I don't think we're going to see much of a change in fiscal policy anytime soon. I think there's a time horizon that we should look at the markets that is also marked by the election. Um, and I think that that'll have bearing on uh, relations between China and the United States and so on. And so if, if, let's step back maybe and put the, the big factors in, in perspective, I think, and then put a time horizon to that. I think the big factors are um, we are rather late in both the short-term debt cycles and the long-term debt cycles, mm -hmm. meaning the capacity of central banks to produce um, stimulation um, it has, can be measured by their ability to lower interest mm -hmm. rates significantly and do quantitative easing and have that purchased. We have a problem there. Okay, that's, that's, that's a big thing, but it's mm -hmm. not an immediate problem. It's a problem that is going to come in the next one or two years. You're seeing it in Europe, you see it in Japan, and to some extent you're seeing it in the United States. In addition, we have the um, wealth gap. Mm -hmm. And with that wealth gap, we have the classic political conflict, very much like the 1930s, in which that means that there's greater polarity, greater extremes mm -hmm. in both of those. And that will be, play a role, because if you change policies, you will have mm -hmm. a big effect. For example, when we cut the, when uh, Trump administration cut corporate taxes, mm -hmm. that co 
put stocks up because after taxes you get more, so you pay more for your stocks. That'll change. So we have this polarity, very much like the 1930s, mm -hmm. an inability to stimulate in the same way, and a polarity. In addition, we have uh, China as an emerging country, mm -hmm. challenging the United States as an, an established country. And that creates a theme. That creates a protectionist type of environment, very much like the 1930s. Mm -hmm. And it also has um, implications in terms of all sorts of conflict and, um, frankly, uh, sand in the gears of the efficiency of the economy. Mm -hmm. For example, the technologies, who's going to be the supply lines. In other words, we mm -hmm. built an economy in which there was interdependency and efficiency coming from supply lines working in a certain way. Mm -hmm. Now, as we enter this environment of conflict, there needs to be, for personal security, for the security of the countries, there is a move toward independence. The United States says, I don't want your technologies. And China says, I can't depend on you giving me your technologies. And that changes that separation changes the nature of the dynamic, which is also an economic influence. Mm -hmm. Those influences are very similar, as, as, as I say, to the late 1930s. They will be dominant. They are evolutionary influences, but they'll play out over the next one, two, three years, I think, in creating a paradigm shift. The world we're going to be in mm -hmm. is a very different world than the world we were in. The world we were in started in 2008 okay. and had to do with central banks printing money and stimulating, mm -hmm. and that is reaching its limit. And that's why I think we're going to see a paradigm shift. Okay, so you're effectively recommending gold in, as a portfolio diversifier. I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm saying a port, gold is an important portfolio diversifier. Mm -hmm. However, let me be clear, I don't think anyone should have a concentrated portfolio mm -hmm. now, okay? So people can hone in on one comment I'm making. Sure. I think that, um, that the notion of creating a balanced portfolio mm -hmm. is the most important thing that they can do right now. Because wealth um, is not, can't so much be destroyed as much as it can be shifted. Mm -hmm. And so the world right now largely looks to me, leverage long. In other words, there's been a lot of borrowing to buy assets, to buy companies. But companies have borrowed money to buy their equities back and so on. That whole move of leverage long is where the market is. I think there's a vulnerability, what I'm saying is, to that kind of a portfolio and that gold is one of the items that can diversify that. But I know that these comments will be taken out yeah. of proportion because the media then grabs that and says, oh, Ray goes and says, go out and buy gold. Um, I, I think it should not be too much or too little of a part of a Just portfolio. out of curiosity, where do you see the price of the yellow metal now hovering around $1,500 an ounce? I have no Will it break the highs of 1900 mm -hmm. seen way back in 2011? Mm -hmm. I, 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 I'm, I'm not going to give a, a price forecast. Or, um, I'm saying that there is an environment that is a risky environment to the value of currencies mm -hmm. because the currencies have to be printed in order to satisfy the obligations, that that is a risk, and that a portion of one's portfolio should be in gold. Okay, so broadly you see there's upside to gold right now. I think it's a good hedge, and I think it probably has upside, yes. Stay with us more with the exclusive interview with Ray Dalio, founder of Bridgewater Associates, in just a moment. When a rising power challenges an existing world power, um, there is plenty to argue about. Are we now looking at a currency war? Managing Asia will be right back. You were right to point out that the volatility in the markets is due to the trade conflict between US and China. It's a fact. Let me get your insights on this. Do you think the root cause of the conflict is because China has clearly shown itself to be a rising power when it comes to technological innovation and prowess? Yes. Yes, I think classically in history, uh, when a rising power challenges an existing world power, um, there is plenty to argue about. Mm. It's a small world for these two countries. So these countries are going to bump into each other in various ways. Of trade is part of it. Trade is the least important part of mm -hmm. it. Technology is very important. It's Check, the root you know, cause. Well, um, there are three causes. I'll, I'll describe it this way. Um, there is trade. 
Uh, but technology is probably the most important mm -hmm. consideration because technology gives all kinds of strengths. It gives, if you read history, it gives economic strength, it gives military strength, and, and so on. Um, and then if you take the third area, there are certain geopolitical mm -hmm. ge geographies and, and um, world influence and alliances and all of those things that enter into it. In other words, so there are three areas, I would say. Mm -hmm. There's trade, which I think is the least important of that. There is technology, which has both commercial and military implications. And there is uh, the geopolitical, uh, what regions, what influence, such as the question of uh, the, the South China Seas and that whole area. Um, that's obviously something that there's uh, conflict mm. about. President Trump recently slapped 10% tariffs on another $300 billion worth of Chinese goods. Now, this culminated in the PBOC letting the Chinese yuan slide beyond the psychological seven level. Trump has since then delayed some of those tariffs, but in your mind, does it somehow seem to you that we've now reached a new phase in the trade conflict? Are we now looking at a currency war? Well, let me be clear. Uh, the PBOC did not push the currency down, okay? That is not currency manipulation. Um, the currency uh, has a supply and demand of its own, and the PBOC made clear that within certain boundaries, they'd like to keep order, mm -hmm. um, um, but within certain boundaries, uh, it's, it is a market. And if you're in favor, not having no currency intervention um, is, is, is what the United States does, and the question is, will we come into an environment of currency intervention? Mm -hmm. I would say I would be more worried almost that the United States might enter uh, an environment of currency intervention to weaken its currency. I and how I likely think, is that? I don't think that that's very likely, um, but um, what happens late in cycles, late in long-term debt cycles, when interest rates are not effective mm -hmm. and quantitative policy is not effective, such as that which we have now, it's, they will be less effective then currency weakness is the common vehicle for stimulating an, occur uh, an economy. Because if your currency goes down, mm -hmm. in domestic currency terms, and you look at your prices of your stocks or you look at prices of assets, they tend to rise and it's stimulative. Mm -hmm. So I think we are entering an environment that over the next three years, you will see more currency wars, uh, uh, whether they're uh, overt interventions or whether they're monetary policies that produce that. Um, for example, the Bank of Japan, when it uh, pursued its stimulative policies, it, it was two parts, not only to make um, money very, very cheap mm -hmm. and make the assets, therefore, unappealing in terms of providing interest rates, but actually the encouragement of investing outside of the country. So that has a depreciating effect on the currency. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to probably see more of those. So the environment over the next three years, I think will be um, quite um, a lot more competitive in terms of the factors I'm mentioning, currency being mm -hmm. one of them. But when it comes to the Chinese, this breach of the seven yuan level, this has not happened in the last 10 years. Is this somehow signal to you, given your experiences, helping China grow its capital markets, that Chinese policymakers are getting more comfortable with a weaker yen to help deal with a trade situation? First of all, I think this, the seven level was, uh, they said, and anybody who's yeah. been trading currencies for a long time <laughs> knows that way too much is, yeah. is made out of a particular level. Mm -hmm. And I, so I think that they handled that appropriately. I think that the, um, I think the PBOC is very skilled in being able to create essentially what is a two-way market mm -hmm. so that it's not easy to bet against or bet for the RMB because if it becomes e e too easy one way or another, it becomes disruptive. Mm -hmm. So I think they manage that well around um, what is the supply-demand mm -hmm. consideration. It's certainly the case that if you have a weakness or if you, particularly if you have an external account weakness, a trade weakness, that currency weakness is the natural course of those of, of that. It's stimulative and it's particularly stimulative and uh, compensatory mm -hmm. for the export part of it in a weak economy. Mm -hmm. So you have your choices. How, do, how are you going to ease an economy? You can lower interest rates, you can do um, 
uh, some quantitative easing. You can do some regulatory, um, um, what's called macro prudential moves, and you can weaken the currency or let the currency weaken. So I think that the market is determining the currency for the most part. Would you be bullish on China still if the Chinese renminbi, the Chinese yuan, continues to weaken? Again, of the um, the currency weakness is part of the natural adjustment process. So you have no problem with that. I have no problem with currency weakness, uh, and I and I would also say, I lo I look at the health of the economy, uh, you know, and and the health of the particular businesses that one is investing in or bonds. Yeah. Chinese bonds uh, offer a, a, an attractive interest rate. Um, now, you have, as you look at that, is that more attractive, that interest rate, than uh, the currency will have a depreciation? Questions like that are all tactical. Mm -hmm. The currency depreciation is just part of, of the adjustment process that takes place because it causes other assets to rise. Mm -hmm. It causes equities to rise. For example, it has that stimulative effect like interest rate declines do. Don't go away, coming up next. Wars um, have a lot to do with how they're going to be played. For example, the United States um, has a lot of its uh, bonds held by China. Managing Asia, we'll be right back. Who can afford to hold out longer, the US or China? Um, wars, um, have a lot to do with um, how they're going to be played. Um, for example, the United States um, has a lot of its uh, bonds held by China. It also has its own uh, dependencies and interdependencies in various ways. So um, it's very difficult. Nobody can say um, who's going to use what pressure points um, in, in terms of the other. I'm not able to call who's stronger but I think that it's a little bit scary mm -hmm. that we're that what we can as we let our imaginations go, and we could see the various harms that these countries can do to each other in the process, and what that'll mean for the world economy. I think that that's the important thing. I couldn't call who will be the winner. And you don't in wars in history, um, there was no knowing who would be the winner. Okay, but we do know that in all of those wars in one form or another, the consequences of those wars were really regrettable by anybody who ventured into it. Even those who chose to go into the war regretted the wars because the wars are so terrible. I don't think we know how this can evolve exactly. Once you get this tit-for-tat thing going, yeah. and, and there are all sorts of ways that, they, that these two countries can do each other harm, or do the world harm in terms of trade and other um, inefficiencies that are created in the capital markets, and inefficiencies in trade in, in, in the supply lines of producing things. It's a lot of sand in the gears and it's a bad situation. You brought up a very important point because China is the U.S. largest foreign creditor holding something like one, more than $1 trillion worth of U.S. Treasuries. Does this somehow give China leverage? Could Beijing weaponize its holdings as part of the trade conflict? Um, could they? Um, of, of course they could. Or is the scenario unlikely? Uh, 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 of course. They, when one goes into this new world, there are a lot of unknowns, okay? And you have to realize that there are different pressure points. There was a symbiotic relationship between the United States. The United States uh, wanted to spend more than it earned and, um, and use that to buy Chinese and other imports. As a result, they sort of both got what they wanted, which were different things. China wanted to get richer. China wanted to build a set savings. The United States wanted to um, get that and really pay for it on credit. Mm -hmm. We have a debtor-creditor relationship, not just a trade relationship, and that that's a, can be a dangerous thing. What are the chances of it happening? I can't, I can't say. I can't say. I could say, as I say, as you get deeper and deeper into wars. But you wouldn't rule it out? I wouldn't rule it out, no. That was the first part of the exclusive interview with Ray Dalio, founder of Bridgewater Associates here in Singapore. Do join us in our next episode for more of the interview. I'm Christine Tan. Thanks for watching.